Welcome to the Robot Olympics. You've been invited to compete in this year's Robot Long Jump. Our goal will be to create an optimal strategy in this mathematical long jump competition. We'll need to understand the rules of the game, learn how to define a strategy, and then explore the subtle question of what it means to be optimal in a game. Let's go ahead and jump into things by laying some ground rules. All robots start at zero on the number line. For each move, the robot decides if it wants to run down the runway or jump from its current position. In both cases, a random uniform variable is drawn from the unit interval. If you chose to jump, then you jump that distance and lock in your final score. If instead you decided to run, then you move that distance and now again decide if you want to run or jump. This process is repeated until you finally decide to jump or you run and you go past one, in which case you fault and receive a score of zero. Ultimately, a long jump consists of repeatedly drawing uniform random variables until you deem that further tempting the RNG gods is too risky and you jump, or your hubris or lack of luck result in a fault. A full match consists of two robots performing a long jump independently. Then, whoever jumps further wins. If both robots fault, then both robots move back to zero and perform another jump. This is repeated until someone outjumps the other. The challenge lies in balancing the risk of faulting with the desire to achieve a score that can't easily be beaten. I encourage you to ponder this trade-off and try and come up with a strategy you would give your robot to represent your country in the robot games. But how can we take this trade-off and turn it into a formal strategy? We can begin by looking at the information we have when we decide whether or not to jump. We know nothing about our opponent, so our only information is our previous runs. Since each random number drawn is independent, our current position is the only relevant information. So our most general strategy is to define the probability we jump from any given position. We could decide randomly regardless of position, or increase the probability that we jump as we get closer to the fault line, or any other function that we deem viable. However, we can narrow down which strategies to consider through the following argument. Let's say we are currently at 0.6, competing against the optimal strategy. If we could play from that position repeatedly, either jumping or running will win more frequently, in which case we should choose that option 100% of the time. Therefore, P of X should either be zero or one, since one option will perform better on average. Finally, if we deem jumping from a given point, say 0 0.45, is the best option, then intuitively it should be the best option for any X greater than 0 0.45, since running only becomes riskier the closer we get to one. In the end, we see that the optimal strategy boils down to a cutoff below which we continue to run, and above which we decide to jump. Now that we know how to define a strategy, my preferred method for approaching a problem is always to try and gain intuition through simulation. To do just that, let's assume we employ a cutoff of one half, and run several random long jumps so we can observe the frequency of where we land, shown in green, and how often we fault, shown by the red arrow at zero. Experimenting both helps lay foundation to approach the problem, as well as provide something to check our understanding against. As we continue performing more long jumps, we begin to see a pattern emerge. We will start our formalization by finding the probability that we jump. A useful first step is to understand the probability we are at x after n runs. This probability can be expressed as the probability that we are at x minus r after n minus one runs, and then run a distance r. If we integrate over all the possible values of r, perform a change of variables, and then account for the fact that we only would have run if we were in the range from zero to c, then we find a formula that allows us to solve for the probability distribution after n runs, given the distribution after n minus one runs. We can now use this to solve for all n. To start, after zero runs, we are at x equals zero. Then we integrate to find the distribution after one run. 
With each subsequent run, the total probability that we haven't jumped or faulted decreases, and the distribution becomes more concentrated near and above the cutoff. We also see that the distribution is always constant above our cutoff since all possible run positions can reach the entire jump region. Ultimately, we can use this formula to determine the distribution after an arbitrary number of runs, n. With this expression in hand, we can calculate the probability that we jump. The total probability is just the sum of the probabilities that we jump after n runs for all n. But the probability that we jump after n runs is just the probability that we are above the cutoff after n runs. And now we simply plug in the expression we found to arrive at our final answer. As a sanity check, we see that if our cutoff is zero, then we always jump, and our probability of jumping is one. On the flip side, if our cutoff is one, then we never jump and retrieve a probability of zero. This calculation also sets us up to understand the landing distribution, assuming we jump. It shows that we jump uniformly from all positions in the jumping range. Additionally, we can use nearly the same integral expression to calculate the probability we land at x assuming we jump. We see that we get back the exact trapezoid distribution that we found through our simulations. We now have all that we need to calculate the average score given a cutoff. The average value is just the average jump times the probability that we actually jump. As we look at how the landing distribution varies with c, it becomes clear that if we jump, the average jump is given by the center of the plateau, 1 plus c divided by 2. We now have the average score as a function of the cutoff, which we see has a single maximum. Solving for the max yields an optimal cutoff of about 0 0.303. So we're done. Well, we have an answer, but we were a little quick and loose with some of our assumptions. Plus, sending a robot to the games is an expensive endeavor. So in an effort to double check our work, and all but guarantee funding, we turn to a tried and true method, machine learning and AI. If we are going to teach a machine to long jump, then it has to start somewhere. We will initialize a neural network so that it plays roughly random to start. We will program two robots with the strategy and have them compete against one another. Once one wins, they will receive a score of one and the loser will receive a score of zero. If we repeat this competition many times, we will accumulate data that we can use to improve our neural network. For us to visualize the data, we can bin it and plot it as how frequently a robot wins when they take a specific action from a given point. When we view the data in this manner, we see that when playing against this given strategy, jumping is favorable further down the track. When we update our neural network with this data, it will slightly nudge our strategy so that we jump less early on and more later. Now we compete robots with this new strategy and repeat this update procedure. The specific algorithm used is called policy gradient. If you want a more in-depth explanation of the algorithm, I've added some references in the description. Slowly, we observe that the neural network is learning that we should always run at small values and always jump once we get closer to the fault line. Let's add in the optimal cutoff we found earlier to check if we recover it here. If we speed up the learning, then we see that the AI learns that a sharp cutoff is favorable, and now it is just honing what the cutoff is. And just as expected, in the end, we get back a different value. The only natural conclusion is that machine learning is a sham black box that can't be trusted. But after repeatedly verifying our incorrectness with different hyperparameters, we must examine why our original calculation, which did correctly calculate the maximum average jump, did not correspond to the optimal strategy. I encourage you to pause the video and contemplate that question yourself. Our error boils down to the subtle fact that maximizing your own performance is not the same as maximizing the chance that you beat your opponent. Consider two hypothetical strategies. With the first, we always score one. And using the second, we score 1.1 70% of the time, and 0 the rest of the time. Despite the second strategy having a smaller average, 0.77 compared to 1, it wins 70% of the time. 
making it the better option. Even though these strategies aren't possible in this game, we will show that better average jumps do not always equate to better strategies when we consider various cutoffs. We sketch a calculation of the probability that someone using a cutoff of C1 beats someone using C2. We can break this probability into three parts. Robot 1 wins if it jumps any distance and Robot 2 falls. Both jump and Robot 1 jumps further. And both fault and then Robot 1 wins after restarting. Luckily, our previous work, although flawed in the last step, sets us up to calculate these quantities. We use the jump probability to calculate the first term. The second term starts with the probability that both robots jump times the probability that player one jumps further. The second half comes down to looking at the probability of all of the possible pairs of jump scores. Since each robot's jumps are independent from one another, the probability of the pair x1, x2 is given by the probability that robot one scores x1 times the probability that robot two scores x2. Then we just integrate over all of the probabilities where robot one outjumps robot two, highlighted in green. Finally, if both robots fault, then the probability is given by neither of them jumping times the original probability that they win. After all, the probability of winning at the beginning is the same as the probability of winning after they both fault, since they are still running the same strategies and starting at zero in both cases. After some rearranging, we have an equation that allows us to solve for the desired probability. So now let us look at the probability that we win if we run the strategy that maximizes our average score. For most values of our opponent's cutoff, C2, we win over 50% of the time. However, there is a narrow region around 0.4 where the opponent can pick a strategy that beats us more than half of the time. As we vary our cutoff, we see that our strategy can always be exploited, except for at one specific value. At this cutoff, the best our opponent can do is to pick the same cutoff. Any other value they choose will decrease their win probability. If both robots run this cutoff, neither can improve their odds by deviating from it, which means that we have found our optimal strategy, or Nash equilibrium. We can formalize the Nash equilibrium by finding the cutoff that results in a minimum when both robots run it. Then, solving the resulting equation gives us an optimal cutoff. We can check if the policy gradient reinforcement learning method was able to find this cutoff. Sure enough, even a relatively naive reinforcement learning algorithm is robust enough to find this Nash equilibrium. Let's recap what we've learned. If there's a single robot, then the optimal cutoff that maximizes its own average return is about 0.303. If we have two robots, then we shift away from maximizing our own return and employ a riskier strategy to reach the Nash equilibrium. To be clear, the robots could come together and agree to both run with the cutoff that maximizes their individual jumps, in which case both win half of the time. But this configuration is unstable since one robot can get greedy and shift to a better strategy. So the only stable configuration is when they reach the Nash equilibrium, where both still have a 50% chance of winning, but now with both being worse off. At this point, we might scoff at the difference in average scores as unimportant, but we can now imagine that the game commission wants to speed things up by running more than two robots at a time. If we ran three robots at once, with all the same rules and the winner taking all, then the optimal cutoff shifts further forward and the individual average continues to drop. Now let's continue to add more and more robots. This effect highlights the counterintuitive nature of Nash equilibriums. In winner-take-all situations, the incentive is no longer for everyone to optimize their individual performance, but rather to employ strategies with more risk which can't be exploited by others. So the robots shift from having an equal chance of winning if all optimize their own jumps to a strategy where they still have an equal chance of winning, but everyone's scores are on average worse off. By the time that there are 10,000 robots, the optimal strategy is to keep running nearly the entire way up to the fault line. 
Nearly every individual run is a fault, and no one is better off. Yet, alas, we cannot escape the Nash equilibrium. This was a math puzzle created by Jane Street. They provide thought-provoking monthly puzzles that are great for procrastinating while still feeling like you're being productive and learning. Even though this problem seems a little silly at face value, it provides a tractable representation of a phenomenon that underpins many real-world challenges. For a great essay on this topic, I encourage everyone to read or listen to Meditations on Moloch by Scott Alexander, linked in the description. Thanks for watching.